Good afternoon. I'm Nancy Bowers with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to the 10th presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. These twice monthly webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Guide to Learning in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Today's presentation will be given by Dr. Ricardo Aziz. Dr. Aziz is the Regents Professor at Georgia Regents University, visiting scholar at the Pullius Center for Higher Education, University of Southern California, and senior fellow at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. Today's talk is entitled Diagnosis of Androgen Disorders in the Hirsute Patient. I'll now turn the microphone over to Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, our education specialist who will review the details of today's presentation and introduce Dr. Aziz. Thank you so much. Hello to everyone. I'm Jeffrey Hayes, the ASRM Education Specialist and Moderator for this webinar. Before beginning the webinar, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, to make sure we can cover all the content in the allotted time, everyone's line except the speakers will be muted. We will devote about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation to questions. Please feel free to type a question in the chat window at any time. We will then read as many selected questions as possible to the presenter during the allotted questions and answer time. If for some reason you need to step away from the presentation, please sign out and then sign back in upon your return. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your CME credit. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. Our speaker today is Dr. Ricardo Aziz. We're very excited to have him with us. So now I will turn things over to Dr. Aziz. Good morning. Thank you very much, Nancy and Jeffrey, for that introduction. Um, let me go ahead and start uh, without uh, much delay. Uh, today we're going to review the diagnosis of androgen excess uh, disorders, uh, uh, particularly those that affect the uh, hirsute uh, patient. You know, as a disclosure, I serve as a consultant for a couple of projects. None of those actually uh, cause any noticeable conflict uh, for you, so you should not be very concerned. Uh, learning objectives, uh, at the conclusion of this presentation, uh, you should be able to summarize and present the differential diagnosis of patients with hirsutism and or virilism, formulate a therapeutic scheme and interpret the necessary diagnostic testing in patients with hirsutism or virilism, and counsel these patients regarding their treatment options and prognosis. Now, let's start out by understanding what the signs of hyperandrogenism are in women which is what will uh, cause us, most of us as clinicians, to say, okay, we need to evaluate this individual. The dermatologic signs are the ones that are most common and the ones that really strike out. Uh, they are obviously hirsutism, a male-like pattern of terminal hair growth on the face and the body. Uh, they can be persistent acne, although acne is a much less exclusive sign, as we'll talk about. And, or you can have alopecia, and alopecia comes in two general forms, uh, either a sort of diffuse uh, the sagittal uh, uh, hair loss, which is primarily found or defined as androgenic alopecia in women, and then a more marked male pattern type balding, which is associated more with virilism. Um, ovulatory dysfunction, again, also accompanies hyperandrogenism. Uh, this ovulatory dysfunction usually is manifested in menstrual disorders, sometimes uh, as we would define them as abnormal uterine bleeding. Of course, it, oligo amenorrhea are the most common signs, but sometimes you do have oligo ovulation that presents in a patient who otherwise states that she has regular periods. You know, and you have to remember that vaginal bleeding alone does indicate ovulation, uh, and so some patients will have oligo ovulatory eumenorrhea. And finally, uh, we have this cluster of signs that we define as virilism. Uh, these are signs that are of, of severe hyperandrogenism in women, uh, and they include masculinization, that is where your body habitus becomes more male-like, your muscle distribution becomes more male-like, you tend to lose your breast uh, uh, volume, and so on. You have clitormegaly, of course, enlargement of the clitoris, which can be only uh, uh, appearing in an adult patient and not associated with any other genital abnormalities or, of course, if the hyperandrogenism has been long-term, you'll have clitormegaly associated with genital fusion and other uh, genital 
malformations. Severe hirsutism, sort of an extreme hirsutism, is considered part of virilism, as is male pattern balding. Now, moving on, if you were to take a large group of patients that came to you uh, for uh, hirsutism uh, and other signs of hyperandrogenism, what you tend to find is the following. About maybe 7% or so of the patients have specific disorders uh, that we call disorders of inclusion. These include androgen secreting, uh, uh, androgen uh, um, uh, secreting neoplasms, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, non-classic adrenal hyperplasia, and uh, what we call normally hair end syndrome of hyperandrogenic insulin resistant acanthosis niger cam syndrome. We're going to talk a little bit about these, but the importance of these disorders is that they are diagnosed by specific testing. And so they tend to be what we call diagnosis of inclusion. They occur in about 7% or so of all women with hyperandrogenism, at least in our experience. And then you have the reverse. You have, you have disorders that are functional, uh, that are disorders of exclusion. The vast majority of those uh, tend to include polystic ovary syndrome. Sometimes uh, some patients will have idiopathic hirsutism. But again, idiopathic hirsutism is becoming increasingly more rare as our ability to detect hyperandrogenism biochemically uh, and functionally increases. And then there are intermediate forms, if you would, of polycystic ovary syndrome and hyperandrogenism. Now, let's talk first about virilizing ovarian tumors or androgen secreting neoplasms. Now, ovarian uh, 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 virilizing tumors are the most common type of androgen secreting neoplasm. They are somewhat less than 1% of all ovarian neoplasms. They occur in about 1 in 300 to 1 in 500 of hirsutism cases. And, and that is not very high frequency, although frankly, as you will know, uh, when your patients come to you, the first thing that they're worried is, do they have a tumor? And again, it's relatively uncommon. The good thing is the majority are palpable and certainly visualizable by transvaginal ultrasonography. Uh, they tend to be low malignancy um, uh, uh, potential, low mortality potential, which allows you time to evaluate these carefully without having to, to, to jump into surgery uh, uh, unknown uh, uh, and uh, without a proper background evaluation. Pathology includes uh, sertoli lighting cells, androblastomas, granulosa the theca cells, and so on. These are all different pathologies that lead to virilizing ovarian tumors. Now, how good is um, a total testosterone, a DHEAS, for detection of an androgen secreting neoplasm? Now, there's much discussion around this issue, uh, and uh, many of the textbooks, in fact, will tell you that a total testosterone is absolutely necessary to screen for a androgen secreting tumor in women. And that, in fact, is probably not true. For example, this is one study uh, we published a number of years ago, 500 or so consecutive hyperandrogenic women. Uh, and only one of these had an ovarian androgen uh, uh, secreting neoplasm. Um, and what we found is that, in fact, uh, if you take a total testosterone, in this case we took an ultra high level of 250 nanograms per DL on a repeat measure, on, in other words, verified by uh, a second uh, uh, evaluation, the, 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 the positive predictive value of this uh, very elevated uh, total testosterone was only about 9%. And that means that really only 9% of individuals that had such a high value on a consistent basis really ended up having an androgen secreting tumor. Uh, in our case, we were not able to really test the predictive value of a DHEAS over 6,000 nanograms per ml. Um, because, in fact, we did not have any androgen secreting tumor, and in this case, uh, we, we didn't find it. So again, total testosterone that are very high certainly can indicate an androgen secreting tumor, but as you will see, androgen secreting tumors are better diagnosed uh, and suspected uh, um, by their clinical presentation. So let's talk about uh, the adrenal androgen secreting tumors. I'm presenting data from Dirksen a number of years ago in 94. And they presented two individuals with adenomas, 12 with adrenocarcinomas. Uh, and of these uh, 14 individuals, 13 presented with either virilization or Christianoid features or both. So they were clinically evident. So immediately upon presentation, 14 out of the uh, 13 out of the 14 that 
already would have been suspected of having an androgen secreting neoplasm just on clinical presentation. Um, 10 out of 14 had hirsutism for greater than two years, 7 out of 14 and 4 out of 14 had onset of hirsutism after the ages of 30 and 50. And as you may remember, functional disorders of, uh, of hyperandrogenism like polystic ovary syndrome tend to present much earlier in life, tend uh, to present generally beginning at around the time of puberty. So how predictive in this group, in this study, of patients with adrenal androgen secreting neoplasms were DHEAS and total testosterone levels? Uh, well, in this case, as you can see uh, on the graph on the left, uh, the basal DHEAS level uh, of patients who had a tumor varied widely from perfectly normal to very, very high uh, levels. Patients who did not have a tumor that were hyperandrogenic um, had also elevated levels of DHEAS. And again, the predictive value of an elevated DHEAS was not very good. Let's look at total testosterone. That is the graph on the right. Uh, if you look at total testosterone, again, total testosterone levels range from totally normal to very, very high levels. Uh, and again, the predictive value of a total testosterone that's elevated for a tumor alone is not very good. So in general, the lesson to learn here is that uh, androgen screen tumors are infrequent, uh, and of course, they tend to be best predicted clinically uh, um, uh, from their presentation, their history, uh, and the signs that they present with. Uh, and of course, they then are diagnosed uh, using radiologic means, either ultrasonography for the ovary, uh, most of the time, uh, adrenal or MRI uh, uh, scanning of the adrenal for adrenal tumors. Now, uh, um, uh, and I am, apologize for this, we have a, a, a graph here, but the adrenal cortical uh, um, steroidogenesis uh, here uh, is, uh, and I'm using my, uh, my arrow here, the, uh, the mineralocorticoid pathway here, you can see that you have a block uh, in the 21-hydroxylase pathway for both uh, progesterone and 21-hydroxylase progesterone. And these is the typical block that you would see uh, for 21-hydroxylase. Now, uh, the, the block that you are uh, presenting that you see here has to be uh, understood that this is not a block. This means that the enzyme, uh, the CYP450C21, that is encoded by CYP21, uh, by CYP21A, which is the gene, is defective. Either it's completely deficient, in which case there is a block, if you would, but nothing is actually blocking. It is a block because there is no enzyme there. Or uh, the, uh, the enzyme itself uh, is, not, uh, is not present or active to the extent that it should be. So let's talk a little bit about 21-hydroxylase deficiency because, in fact, non-classic adrenal paplasia is the most common form of this disorder. Now, in general, when we talk about 21-hydroxylase deficient, uh, uh, um, we have basically a, um, a continuum. You know, we often talk about three different disorders, uh, salt-wasting congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which you'll see here at the top. You'll see simple virilizing congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is in the middle. And then you'll see non-classic adrenal hyperplasia, uh, which is at the bottom. However, the reality is that this is a continuum, that patients present with salt-wasting uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and then with simple virilizing CH, which actually does have some subclinical renin abnormalities indicating that there is some aldosterone deficiency. And then you will have the simple virilizing patients who have normal renin, and then you will have non-classic patients who present very early in life and even may have mild degrees of clitoromegaly. Uh, then those, uh, the vast majority of non-classics will present at puberty, in the teens, and then eventually in older age. So 21-hydroxylase is a uh, continuum, if you would. The prevalence of 21-hydroxylase deficient non-classic and replacement among hyperandrogenic women uh, is, uh, ranges and depends really on the ethnic, uh, ethnicity of the patients. In Anglo-Saxon populations, for example, in the United States, the vast majority, with some exceptions, really account for maybe 1 to 2 percent of all hirsute women. In, in Europe and in Canada, uh, that is a little bit higher, around between 4 and 6 percent of patients will be affected uh, with non-classic adrenal paplasia. Uh, 
uh, of uh, Hirsut women. And in other countries, India, Jordan, Israel, uh, and so on, among Ashkenazi Jewish patients, uh, for example, you'll have a much higher rate, somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of Hirsut women will be, uh, will be affected uh, by uh, uh, non-classic adrenal plasia. Now, how do you diagnose non-classic adrenal plasia? Well, in general, it's very easy. It is an endocrine diagnosis, not a genetic diagnosis. It is actually impossible to actually screen for all of the genes that affect CYP21 unless you actually sequence the entire gene, which would not be, uh, at this point, uh, very cost effective. So it is an endocrine diagnosis, right? And the uh, egg diagnosis is established by giving a bolus of ACTH uh, and then stimulating the level of 17-hydroxyprogesterone, that is the immediate precursor for 17, uh, I'm sorry, for 21-hydroxylase or CYP21A uh, activity. And then you're stimulating that over a period of 30 to 60 minutes. The reality is the time is not exactly important. Uh, it is a very robust test. We usually recommend that you measure the second blood test at 60 minutes. Now, the, the cutoff, the endocrine cutoff, is not exact and as all uh, endocrine testings are. So if the stimulated value of the 17 interaction progesterone is less than 10 nanograms per ml, then this will uh, generally exclude almost to 100 percent, but not perfect, uh, a patient with non-classic adrenal hypoplasia. Alternatively, if the value is somewhere between 10 and 15 nanograms per ml, the stimulated 17 uh, HP value, the chances of that patient having a non-classic adrenoplasia will range between 20 and 60 percent. And the reason is that it depends on the prevalence of carriers within that population, because there are a number of carriers uh, that, when stimulated, can give you a 17 HP level within that range. Uh, finally, if you have values of 17 HP above and beyond 16 nanograms per ml, the chances of you actually having a positive aplasia is almost 100 percent. But finally, if the level is extraordinarily high of 17 HP, then you're probably dealing with a patient with classic adrenal aplasia, and hence the proportion of non-classics will drop. But again, it's a very good test. It's a robust test. It's an easy test to perform. It has very little, if any, side effects. Some patients will feel a little bit of flushing. But in general, it's an easy test to do. Um, continuing, uh, and we will see that, in fact, you don't have to do an ACTH stimulation test on every patient that is hyperandrogenic. You can actually effectively screen for non-classic intraplasia using a basal 17-HP level. Um, this is a study we did a number of years ago, and you can see that these are individuals with uh, genetically proven non-classic adrenoplasia, and the vast majority of their basal 17-HP level, the level before stimulation, was actually above 2 nanograms per ml. Um, it's a little bit less uh, specific if you do the testing in the afternoon. Uh, one of the patients had a level below 2 nanograms per ml if the testing was done in the afternoon. So we generally recommend that to screen for non-classic adrenal paplasia, 21-hydroxylase deficient non-classic adrenal paplasia among hyperandrogenic women, that you obtain a 17-hydroxyprogesterone in the morning, uh, uh, basically in an unstimulated conditions. Alternatively, uh, it is important to obtain this testing in the follicular phase. For example, this is a series of normal uh, eight normal women who were tested in the follicular phase and were tested in the um, in the luteal phase, and you can see that about half the women or more uh, that were normal uh, actually had elevated levels of 17 HP above and beyond two nanograms per ml uh, if they were tested in the luteal phase. So it's important to uh, do the testing for 17 hydroxyprogesterone uh, in patients uh, who are and ovulatory uh, pre-follicular, that may uh, be uh, best to test them after they have a period, and if they don't have a period, to test them after they have a withdrawal bleed. But in patients who are completely amenorrheic, of course, uh, doing the testing at any time will probably be just as fine. Now, moving away from non-classic adrenal hyperplasia, we now need to move to the Haran syndrome. Now, the Haran syndrome uh, features um, uh, stands out, if you would, the HERAN acronym stands out for hyperandrogenic uh, insulin-resistant acanthosis nigercan syndrome. Now, uh, 
It's a little bit difficult to distinguish the syndrome from patients who have garden variety PCOS. Uh, as you'll see, patients with garden variety PCOS often have uh, insulin resistance. But these individuals generally have a much greater uh, degree of insulin resistance than patients with garden variety PCOS. Their peak insulin during an OGTT, for example, will be well over 300, if not 500 uh, microunits per mL. Many of them will have severe high, uh, acanthosis nigricans, but most importantly, many of them will have uh, lipodystrophy. In other words, uh, a abnormal distribution of fat throughout the body. For example, they can be very lean in their body and their in their in their core and in their extremities, but have a large amount of fat deposition in the jowls or the vulva and so on and so forth. So uh, these patients tend to be considered something different than just your standard. Uh, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome that tend to be a much greater risk for cardiovascular disease and other, uh, um, and other uh, uh, morbidities uh, related to metabolic dysfunction. Uh, again, they have acanthosis. Again, acanthosis is, refers to the widening and the flattening of the red uh, PG uh, of the skin under the dermis of the skin. The skin, even though it looks rough, is very, very soft because, in fact, uh, most of the proliferation occurs at the basal level of the epidermis, not the epidermis. And so uh, it is uh, something that distinguishes from, say, hyperkeratosis. Um, uh, they're very severely affected metabolically, uh, and they tend to be, as I said, a distinct entity, uh, different uh, generally from PCOS. Um, moving on, uh, those are some of the uh, disorders uh, of hyperandrogenism that we consider to be disorders of inclusion. Um, idiopathic uh, hirsutism uh, is the next disorder. And it used to be that if you looked at the textbooks in the past, idiopathic hirsutism was a very frequent cause of hirsutism in women. Today, we actually don't believe that. We believe that hirsutism, uh, idiopathic hirsutism, affects probably less than 5% of all women, in fact, or probably much less than that. And that is because as we have gotten uh, or we have uh, developed better uh, androgen assays for uh, uh, understanding the biochemistry of women, uh, and we have begun to understand better the functional disorders that affect uh, patients with hyperandrogenism, we've actually been able to determine that the vast majority of patients with idiopathic hirsutism in the past really had uh, forms of polycystic ovary syndrome. And so at this point, uh, we really need to define idiopathic hirsutism very strictly. There has to be no evidence of increased circulating androgen levels using the highest quality assays possible. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, they have to have normal ovarian morphology. They have to have regular ovulation. And that means proven regular ovulation, not just regular menses. 40% uh, of women who are hirsute and claim to have regular menses actually have uh, an ovulation. So they have to have uh, proven uh, regular ovulation. A luteal progesterone level on a couple of different cycles is probably sufficient to prove that. Uh, it is often familial, but so are uh, all the other disorders that we're talking about. I mean, polycystic ovary syndrome is extraordinarily familial, uh, and so uh, and so is Heron syndrome, for that matter. And so, in general, we don't really uh, uh, consider the fact that my parents or my mother, whatever, had hirsutism as a sign that that is idiopathic hirsutism and not something else. So, again, it's probably uh, not any more familial than other disorders. It may be due to increased peripheral utilization of sensitivity to androgens. Uh, studies have had conflicting uh, results in this regard. But again, part of the reason they've had conflicting uh, results is that, one, the definition of idiopathic hirsutism has been changing. And two, elevated circulating androgens themselves tend to increase the peripheral sensitivity uh, to androgens. And so androgens themselves tend to do that. And it is hard sometimes when you detect an increased sensitivity to androgens in the skin, whether that actually refers to um, a, um, uh, a, uh, a, a increase in the utilization or sensitivity to androgens or a result of the circulating androgens. Now, it also may reflect inadequate laboratory analysis. The vast majority of patients that I see with idiopathic crystalline simply have been evaluated using suboptimum uh, techniques for transvaginal ultrasonography and for uh, um, androgen uh, assays. And so at the end of the day, simply um, they were used, uh, um, we were using insensitive measures. And so that's why we didn't detect the underlying causes of these, uh, of these uh, patients' hirsutism. 
Um, now, uh, let's speak about polycystic ovary syndrome, shifting gears a little bit. Uh, now, polycystic ovary syndrome is, accounts for about 85% of all hyperandrogenic women, uh, and we've been talking about some of the more rare causes, but really the vast majority of patients have some form or another of polycystic ovary syndrome. The best way to understand polycystic ovary syndrome today is to, to, to understand that one must classify patients, one must understand these patients clinically based on the presence or absence of certain features. And so there are three primary features that we tend to group this way. Uh, the features of androgen excess, which includes hirsutism uh, or hyperandrogenism uh, or hyperandrogenemia, uh, in other words, uh, blood levels that are elevated. So androgen excess is the major one here. Ovulatory dysfunction, uh, is the second uh, characteristic of polycystic ovary syndrome, again, often reflected by menstrual dysfunction, but not always. And then polycystic ovarian morphology, uh, in the past obtained primarily through surgery, now obtained, of course, primarily through ultrasonography. So if you take these three features or three characteristics, you can then build four different phenotypes of these patients, right? Um, either they have everything, right, all three features, androgen excess, ovulatory dysfunction, polycystic ovaries, or they have uh, only uh, androgen excess and, poly and uh, ovarian dysfunction, but no polycystic ovary morphology. Uh, they may have androgen excess and polycystic ovarian morphology, but no evidence of ovulatory dysfunction, the so-called ovulatory PCOS patient. And they may have ovulatory dysfunction and polycystic ovaries, but really no a measurable evidence of androgen excess, the so-called non-hyperandrogenic polycystic ovary syndrome. So the different definitions uh, out there include the original NIH 1990. This was very strict. The NIH 1990 included just these two phenotypes, patients with androgen excess, ovulatory dysfunction, with or without polycystic ovarian morphology. Rotterdam, uh, a, uh, a statement that came out of a group of investigators, uh, both American and, uh, and European, said, no, 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 we, this, is, uh, this is too narrow. We need to broaden the definition. And they included these two different phenotypes here, patients who had androgen excess and polycystic ovaries but seemed to be ovulating normally, and patients who had polycystic ovaries and ovarian dysfunction but no evidence of androgen excess. And finally, the Androgen Excess and PCOS Society uh, reviewed the literature, tried to come up with some, uh, uh, some evidence-based approach to this, and said, well, these three appear to be related uh, because they are related by metabolic dysfunction, although this has less metabolic dysfunction than these two features. But this uh, phenotype really did not seem to be associated, at least at that time. Now, what is, one thing that is important for all of us to understand about uh, polycystic ovary syndrome is that you must always remember it is a diagnosis of exclusion. That means that you must obtain 17-HP, TSH, and prolactin to actually exclude these uh, patients. Uh, and so uh, it, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. 17-HP, TSH, and prolactin must always be obtained. Uh, otherwise, you don't really know uh, whether you have PCOS uh, or non-classic aerobic or uh, some disorder reflecting thyroid or prolactin abnormality. Now, how do you evaluate a patient with hyperandrogenic, uh, who is hyperandrogenic or is hirsute? Well, it is uh, basically uh, old-style medicine. You do spend an awful lot of time, and you should, uh, obtaining a good history and a good physical. 90% of the time, the diagnosis will be pretty evident uh, um, on history and physical, uh, and of course, then it gets confirmed or, ex or other diagnoses excluded by laboratory testing. So, a good history of uh, drug therapy, drug ingestion. That this patient uh, was this patient exposed to anabolic drugs, androgenic drugs of some sort, skin irritants. Uh, local uh, excessive use of skin irritants can cause a coarse hair growth uh, uh, in on the skin. Uh, good history of, of uh, a good menstrual history. When did the period start? How frequent were they at the beginning? Uh, what has happened with them over time? Uh, you know, those uh, that is important. Change in weight uh, is important. But very often, these patients have been gaining weight at a rate of about uh, 10 pounds a year, uh, and it's almost progressive if you actually talk with them about it. Uh, change in head or extremity size uh, for acromegaly is important to understand that. 
And family history, of course, is important because, as I said before, many of these disorders, uh, uh, including polystic ovary syndrome, have strong genetic uh, um, background. Now, a physical exam should include a, a very good assessment of the hair pattern and type of hair growth. We'll talk about that in a minute. Assessment of galacteria, assessment for acanthosis, nigricans, uh, we talked about that earlier. Um, cushionoid features, you know, a patient who has cushionoid features plus hirsutism, that patient is one that uh, one should worry very much about an interesting cheating neoplasm, particularly an adrenal uh, adrenal cortical carcinoma. Again, uh, the combination of hirsutism and cushionoid features is not a, uh, a good sign and requires rapid and effective, uh, I'm sorry, rapid and efficient uh, evaluation. Quintermegaly and virilization, of course, are signs that you'll be looking for, and also the regional distribution of obesity. And this can be often assessed by a waist-hip ratio. Uh, you measure the waist at the widest uh, portion uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the belly button area, if you would, at the height of the umbilicus. Uh, and then, of course, the thighs, the hips at the widest portion of the thighs. Now, it's very critical to um, actually be uh, sure to evaluate uh, patients with um, uh, excess hair growth on their, on their body. This is a patient that I saw many, many years ago. Uh, she was 65 or so. She had come in. Her husband had sent her in because, uh, you know, he complained that she apparently had more hair growth than he did. Um, and so when I examined her chin and so on, I mean, she did have a little bit of hair growth here, but you know, it's not extraordinary. This is a woman who is postmenopausal and uh, and often will have a little bit of uh, unopposed uh, androgen effect if she's not on estrogen replacement. And so um, we we really were going to send her home, and then we said, let's examine the rest of your body. Well, the rest of your body really was like this. I mean, it was a significantly her suit individual. Uh, and uh, this is the same patient that you just saw. Of course, that really was much more worrisome, particularly when she told us that, in fact, uh, three years ago she had none of this. Uh, and so this patient ended up having a uh, ovarian androgen secreting neoplasm. Um, one of the things that is important uh, in the evaluation of these patients is to assess their degree of hair growth. Um, it's not enough to say, well, I think you're hairy, you're not, and so on and so forth. That's really not the most scientific approach. Um, the method that we tend to recommend is a visual screening. It's a subjective measure, if you would. But again, uh, to do that, um, it requires subjectivity, but at least you standardize it for your own practice. So generally, we evaluate nine areas. Uh, that is why it's called a modified Fairman-Galloway. Um, Fairman-Galloway originally studied 11 body areas. We only use nine. Uh, um, they uh, excluded, or we've excluded over time, the lower arm and the lower legs because, again, they do present with hirsutism, but they present with excess terminal hair growth even in women who are not hirsute, so it's not really a very good indicator. And then you would assess the upper lip, the uh, chin and, uh, and uh, neck area, the upper chest, uh, upper abdomen, lower abdomen, or what's called male scutcheon the um, um, uh, upper arms, the uh, thighs, the front and back, the upper back and the lower back. These are the nine body areas. If a patient does not have terminal hair growth in that area, it's a zero, so we don't really count it. A little bit of terminal hair is a one. A very hirsute man or a hair growth like that of a very hirsute man is a four. Um, two is more than just a little bit, but not quite that of a man, and three, is um, a man but is not quite hairy. So again, it is subjective, uh, and but it is important to standardize the measurements, uh, and so you would circle the areas depending on what you observe. Now, we uh, published a number of years ago uh, a, a, an atlas, a visual atlas of the different degrees and scores, and for example, lower abdomen, this is the upper lip. Uh, I suggest that you uh, find this uh, publication. This is very good for uh, to serve as reference, uh, and so this was a method of standardizing visually uh, how the score works. Now, it's important to understand that hirsutism varies significantly uh, in patients, right? I mean, because we often talk about uh, um, hirsutism, FG score, uh, 
Uh, and we say, well, it's an FG score of 8 or 10 or 6 or whatever it is. But the truth is that when you look at the distribution of hair growth, and as we did a number of years ago in this particular study, 350 normal black women, uh, or not normal, but uh, general population black women, and uh, 283 general population white women, you can see that the distribution of white and black patients is pretty much the same. There's not a lot of difference in their hair growth. But if you look here at the distribution of three, patients in this area here really did not complain of excess hair growth, did not have abnormalities, did not have endocrine abnormalities. The patients who had a scores of three and more, this group right here, tended to have much more complaints of uh, excess hair growth. Uh, they used uh, electrology much more. They had much more uh, endocrine abnormalities, more frequent endocrine abnormalities. So in general, if you simply do a study and you use cluster analysis, you will find that an FG score of three or more generally indicates abnormal terminal hair growth. So most women uh, do not have a lot of terminal hair growth on their body, most women who are black or white. Uh, this, again, does not include the periareolar hair growth. Uh, many women tend to have that and so on. But in general, this is an indication that often when we use a cutoff of, say, six, uh, to define hirsutism using a modified pyramid gallery score, but that often is a more strict criteria than actually nature calls for. Now, one of the things that we did to prove that this was the case was that we studied 228 women who had minimal unwanted hair growth. They had really FG scores of less than five, most of them really two to five, and they came to us because they were concerned because their hair was different. They felt that they were different than other women, uh, their sisters, their, um, uh, uh, their friends, uh, colleagues. And so we studied these women, and 54% of them actually did demonstrate an androgen excess disorder, the vast majority, of course, having PCOS. So in fact, you know, it's very important to listen to patients when they say that they uh, really need to have um, uh, unwanted, that they have unwanted hair growth, even though you can't really tell much when you examine them. Uh, it's important to listen to the patients in this regard. Of course, uh, you know, if, if the patients are complaining of unwanted hair growth and they have menstrual irregularity, that increases the proportion of having an androgen exit disorder, although not exclusively. Even those that had normal menstrual function did have an abnormal, uh, uh, did have an androgen excess disorder. Now, what about the laboratory evaluation? Well, let's go through this carefully. The first thing about the, value, the evaluation of a patient who is already clinically hyperandrogenic, uh, the first thing is not to necessarily prove that they're hyperandrogenic further, right? So an androgen measures are not the first thing that needs to be tested. The first thing we need to do is we need to exclude other disorders that sound like, present like this patient that we have, right? So if a patient who is illegal ovulatory, one of the things that we need to exclude is either thyroid abnormalities or hyperprolactinemia by measuring TSH and prolactin. Uh, and in a patient who is hyperandrogenic, we must exclude non-classic adrenoplasia by measuring basal levels of 17 hydroxyprogesterone, as I said earlier. Um, in patients who are hirsute but eumenorrheic, they say, yes, I have regular periods and I can predict when they come here. It is important to confirm that they are ovulatory by measuring a data 22 to 24 progesterone level. All you're trying to do is confirm that they're ovulatory. Uh, and again, in our experience, uh, about 40% of her suit women are actually anovulatory when you do this. Should you measure more than one month? I mean, certainly it's optimum if you measure two months of progesterone rather than one month. But again, it depends on your patients and that of your patient. Um, and finally, it is important to use uh, androgens, but when you're going to measure androgens, you must really use a very high-quality, well-referenced assay. Uh, and you would use androgens, uh, and the most uh, obviously important, in patients who are either not hirsute or obviously hirsute or minimally hirsute. You know, these patients come to you and say, well, I have some issues and I'd like to be treated. So that would be very, very helpful. Uh, in those patients, you know, adolescents, uh, patients of Asian origin, and so on and so forth. So androgens are very useful in the patient whose hyperandrogenism is not clear. But if, they're, if it's clinically clear, the value of these androgens becomes much less. When you do use them, you must use highly sensitive, highly specific, high-quality assays. You know, measuring total testosterone, for example, using uh, 
mass spectrometry and free testosterone using uh, equilibrium dialysis based on that uh, total testosterone and so on and so forth. So these are uh, very important uh, to remember. Now, why are androgen levels normal in some patients with androgen excess? I mean, no matter how hard we study, and we have some very good techniques, about 20% of the patients with androgen excess or PCOS have normal androgen levels. And it's not something that we can just simply say, well, the androgens uh, uh, assays that we use are bad. We may be measuring not the right androgens, right? And so the first thing we need to know is that the measurement of androgens is notoriously difficult, particularly in women. These are relatively low level of, of, uh, of molecules. These molecules are difficult to, to measure, certainly measure by radium amino assay. It makes them very difficult uh, to do that. Uh, secondly, the normal range of most assay kits is often established by a manufacturer and not by the user. And they're often established in women that may not be entirely normal. Remember, if the prevalence of polycystic ovary syndrome is about 10% of the general population, and you have 100 women uh, randomly from your laboratory, you may be including 10% of women there who have polycystic ovary syndrome already. So again, many, many kits do not have clear ranges established, in other words, the super controls that we would like to see. Uh, and finally, uh, however, there's a biological reason for this variability. In humans, there is no tight endocrine regulation of androgen levels in women or even in men. Not like uh, thyroid where T4 goes up and TSH goes down and so on and so forth. You know, we don't see that with androgens. You have to really uh, crank up androgens to extraordinarily high levels before LH begins to be suppressed, for example. And so there is great variability of androgen levels among individuals. We've tested this. We've studied this. And so it's not abnormal to have women who are hyperandrogenic for themselves, maybe they've even doubled their androgen levels, and still be within this so-called normal range. So again, it's not surprising that some androgen levels are normal. That should not dissuade you from saying the patient is not hyperandrogenic uh, uh, unless, uh, you know, in, in the presence of other signs that suggest hyperandrogenism. Now, let's talk a little bit about treatment of androgen excess. Uh, we have just a few more minutes left uh, before I want to open the uh, discussion to, um, to, uh, to questions. Uh, so first and foremost, you need to, to be very clear about what the goals for treatment are with a patient. You need to talk to her and say, what is it that you really want us to treat, right? I mean, sometimes they want us to treat her, her dermatologic signs, other weight, uh, sometimes it's uh, her infertility, et cetera. And so it's very clear and important that we define what their goals are, maybe dermatologic or obituary menstrual dysfunction control, uh, maybe the treatment of menstrual uh, metabolic abnormalities. Very often, we, are the do we, the doctors, have those that present that because the patients tend to forget it, uh, infertility, of course. And so in, uh, the optimum treatment is generally combination therapy. It's not a single drug. There's no magic red button that you can press for most of these patients. It does require combination therapy, not just the medications, but also social and psychological support, the dietary and nutrition counseling. Uh, a number of different uh, avenues. Um, so let's go through this. Uh, you know, first uh, uh, approach to many of these patients, of course, because many of those have polycystic ovary syndrome, will be to suppress the source of androgens. And you could do that with uh, oral contraceptive pills, uh, estrogen progesterone combinations, if they're not tolerating that very well. Um, the, the, um, the insulin sensitizers, metformin, and what remains of thiazolidine diones on the market, can have an effect, a modest effect, on suppressing androgens uh, from the ovaries, but again, it's not a very powerful effect. Long-acting GnRH analogs uh, have been used experimentally, but that's not something that we would use long-term other than in patients uh, who uh, are uh, needing temporary suppression of their uh, ovarian androgen production, say a patient with severe Hiram syndrome. Um, if the adrenal is the primary source, for example, a patient with non-conjugate hypoplasia, uh, uh, glucocorticoids would be the first line therapy, although, again, many patients with non-classic hypoplasia will actually also benefit from oral contraceptives. Um, and so this is one way to do that. Of course, if you're talking about uh, a tumor, obviously removing a tumor uh, is, uh, surgically would be the, the preferred method of treatment. Um, oral contraceptives tend to work by two methods. Uh, it suppresses LH, uh, which then suppresses testosterone production by the ovarian theca and it then increases SHBG, which then uh, by production by the liver, which then uh, increases testosterone binding capacity, and then both of these result in 
lower testosterone, free testosterone levels. Um, you then need to consider whether this patient is going to require or benefit from androgen blockade. If a patient is hirsute, she will definitely uh, benefit from androgen blockade. This will include the use of spironolactone, flutamide, uh, and flutamide, which are androgen receptor blockers primarily, finasteride, which is a 5-alpha reductor receptor. Uh, uh, 5-alpha reductase uh, inhibitor, and uh, cyprinone acetate, which actually acts uh, a bit like an androgen receptor blocker. So uh, spirolactone is FDA approved as a diuretic and aldosterone antagonist, and it works quite well. The primary side effects are gastritis, uh, dry skin fatigue, and about 80% of these patients actually have some degree of side effects from spironolactone. The vast majority, however, are well tolerated. Um, the spironolactone, like any of the other drugs that are anti-androgenic, will be teratogenic, particularly to a male fetus, and can result in abnormalities of uh, the uh, uh, genitalia. So again, I only administer anti-androgens to patients who are on a good um, uh, contraceptive. Flutamide, very similar. It's an FDA approved as an adjunct treatment for the uh, for prostatic cancer in men, uh, and again. Uh, it does have the side effect, uh, unfortunately, of a rare hepatic toxicity. So we tend to stay away from this unless absolutely ne necessary. We monitor uh, liver functions closely in these patients. Of course, it continues to be teratogenic. Um, finasteride, again, is uh, FDA approved for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia, um, and usual dose is about 5 milligrams a day. And side effects, again, decreased libido, which actually occurs in most of these uh, can occur with most of these uh, anti-androgenic drugs. Again, continues to be teratogenic. Uh, what about use of these drugs? There's a couple of very good studies from uh, Italy. Uh, Paolo Moghetti uh, published a study uh, a number of years ago, very well uh, done. And, uh, and in this particular study, um, the um, all of these anti-androgens, flutamides, prolactone, finasteride, really work pretty much the same. Finasteride a little bit less potent than spironolactone and and uh, and uh, flutamide. But again, uh, in a randomized uh, study, clearly the the addition of these medications was much better than not at all. Um, Cyprinone acetate, uh, again, as I said before, it's a progestogen, so it often is included in small doses, two milligrams in birth control pills, but to be effective as a androgen receptor competitor, uh, you need to have much higher doses, and usually we recommend uh, doses of 12 and a half to up to even 80, 100 milligrams a day of subprotonone continuously. So the amount that is in birth control pills that are found in Europe, for example, is rarely very small to have a significant clinical effect. Um, in this uh, study from Venturoli, a randomized prospective study looking at flutamide, finasteride, ketoconazole, and cyprinone acetate, uh, um, uh, in this case, combination 12.5 milligrams a day plus ethanol estradiol. All of them work very, very well, as you can see from this particular uh, treatment. Uh, uh, and uh, again, all seem to be relatively useful. Uh, and should you use um, uh, birth control pills alone or birth control pills in combination with anti-androgens? The data in general states that, uh, and most recommendations are today, that we begin with birth control pills in patients who are hirsute. But clinically, if the patient is significantly hirsute uh, or uh, she is quite impatient or wants the most rapid effect possible, then a combination of birth control pills plus an anti-androgen would be very helpful. In this case, for example, uh, we're illustrating here idiopathic hirsutism on the left, palingitic ovary syndrome on the right in this particular study from Italy. And you can see that they have in the blue bar is Diane or birth control pill only, and in the yellow bar it's Diane plus finasteride. And you can see that the addition of finasteride to the birth control pill caused a much more significant uh, decrease in hair growth at three and six months compared to just birth control pills alone. So we generally recommend combining treatment, particularly in patients with significant hair growth. So in the end, the treatment of androgen excess-related disorders, um, <coughs> we generally see that uh, acne improves very, very quickly with birth control pills or uh, uh, other suppression. Legal ovulation takes two, uh, two to six months. Uh, there's hirsutism. Uh, 
which takes between three and eight months. And finally, alopecia, which takes a lot longer and in many patients, unfortunately, does not improve very much. Uh, treatment of hirsutism should be accompanied by mechanical and cosmetic uh, treatments. Uh, plucking is something we discourage actively, as is waxing, because that's really mass plucking. Uh, and uh, in general, that tends to destroy, cause infections of the follicle and cause folliculitis. Ingrown hairs make things worse. Shaving does not accelerate hair growth, and so if the patient is, is, uh, is accepting of shaving, uh, of course, it does have its uh, psychological issues, but if the patient accepts shaving, that actually is a good way to maintain hair growth control along with cosmetics. A bleaching chemical depilators can be used, although you have to be careful not to irritate the skin. Electrolysis and lasers, uh, again, uh, are used often. Uh, it is important, however, to understand that uh, electrolysis, while there are three means today, the blend method being the most commonly used today, you know, there are no good prospective randomized uh, controlled trials of this. In fact, there are none, uh, only experience. Uh, in this uh, study from Richards a number of years ago, 35,000 hours uh, of electrology in 281 women, noted that 93% of patients improved, but again, uh, that uh, is observational um, and from that point of view. And if you look at laser treatment, this is an older study, but they have not really changed over time, you will see that actually the treatment of lasers is only temporary, and by six months, all patients have regained their hair growth to the degree that they was before, uh, to a vast degree. So, in fact, lasers tend to be temporary in the vast majority of patients. Um, and finally, we have the use of, uh, uh, of uh, what we call the fluorinothene hydrochloride. Uh, it is marketed as uh, a Vanica, if you would, a 13.9% uh, uh, mix. And this is from the original clinical trials. Uh, there is significant success in about 50% of patients uh, um, by topical application of the product, mostly on the uh, face. Finally, uh, we're going to get to an algorithm of uh, clinical history and physical exam. Uh, I think it's important, uh, and we were not going to run through this, all of this at this time, but at this point, uh, you will see that a clinical history occurs, uh, and then you will need to then determine, this has been published by Escobar uh, Morial, uh, because again, rapid onset, rapid progression, virilization, of course, talks about tumors. We perceive that slower progression and so on will proceed then through the evaluation that we spoke today to get to the functional disorders uh, that we spoke about earlier. And the algorithm for the treatment of hirsutism is a consensus statement from the androgen excess and PCOS society. If you have hirsutisms, you would like to try lifestyle modifications and cosmetic procedures. If they're seeking fertility, they should delay any further drug therapy for hirsutism until their pregnancy is delivered. If they're not seeking fertility, uh, and uh, they have no contraindication to, uh, to oral contraceptives, we should begin treatment with oral contraceptives. If not satisfactory, add, as I said before, an antiandrogen. And if there are contra contraindications to oral contraceptives, then we would proceed with antiandrogens with some other form of secure ovulant contraception. Very well. So uh, this is, uh, again, uh, just to conclude, overall, about 80% of patients who are compliant on hirsutism therapy will demonstrate improvements. And I very much appreciate everybody's attention, uh, uh, and I think at this point we will be open uh, to questions. Jeffrey. Thank you so much, Dr. Aziz, for a very illuminating presentation. We do have a question. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Nancy Bowers. We know that the uh, PCOS is common or more common in obese women, but not exclusively. Um, is there a similar association of hirsutism outside of the PCOS diagnosis with obesity? So, um, uh, and, and I should uh, I should just tell the, uh, the the listeners that obviously the the discussion of PCOS is a separate uh, lecture, a, a separate uh, topic, but but PCOS. So the relationship of obesity and PCOS actually appears to be partly true and partly not true. In other words, the prevalence of polycystic ovary syndrome is about 6% uh, to maybe 15% worldwide, and it doesn't change uh, by the degree of obesity of the country, so that the prevalence of PCOS is very much the same in Spain, which has a much lower rate of obesity than, say, the United States. 
So in part, the obesity that we observe in polyethic ovary syndrome is a reflection of the environment. Um, but again, it is true that patients with PCOS tend to, we don't have the data yet, but tend to be a little bit more obese than normal. Um, so Nancy, repeat your question so, before, uh, so, so that I can answer that specifically. So is there, is there some similar association with hirsutism outside of the PCOS diagnosis in obese women? Is it hirsutism and obesity, basically? No, no. And, and so the, the relationship of hirsutism and obesity uh, is primarily through polystic ovary syndrome. In fact, if you study obese women only, in other words, uh, uh, if you study the physiology of obesity, we did this many, many years ago, as have others, uh, you will see that actually androgen levels actually decrease in obese individuals, right? Because the more obese you are, the more uh, uh, you tend to actually suppress androgen production. So in women, in fact, uh, we found that their androgens were actually a little bit lower in women who are non-hyperandrogenic obese. So obesity itself does not cause hirsutism other than, obviously, to allow a subclinical polycystic ovary syndrome to uh, become clinically evident. Great, thank you. Um, I don't think we have any more questions, so um, I'm going to let Dr. Jeffrey Hayes finish up with instructions. Thank you so much, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. Please remember to return to ASRM eLearn to successfully uh, uh, to, to take the post test successfully and complete the survey uh, to receive CME credit uh, for this particular activity. Uh, our next live webinar is Thursday, February the 11th at 6 p.m. Eastern with Dr. David Lee. Dr. Lee will be presenting the second part of his talk on malarian variants. Registration for that activity is open. Uh, you can go to ASRM eLearn to register uh, as uh, well to see part one of Dr. Lee's talk, uh, which is currently um, available. Thank you so much to Dr. Aziz for taking time out to give this presentation today. Thank you all for attending. This webinar is now ended.